Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of our Let's Learn series for Victoria 3. Now, quick recap of the first episode for those of you who may have clicked on episode 2 straight away. Or, you know, if some time has passed between you, you watching two episodes. But we're playing as Serbia, a one nation state in Eastern Europe that is woefully behind uh, economically and politically, starting as pretty much a semi-feudal society wedged in between two great powers straight away, Ottoman Empire and Austria, uh, starting off, in fact, as a protectorate of the Ottoman Empire, which is means we're not independent, but we are pretty much fully autonomous, uh, although we are, I think, forced to be part of the Ottoman uh, market, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in itself, because uh, it lets us access you know, some of the goods and export some of our goods in the internal Ottoman market. However, Further down the line, we will zoom in, and our objective for this playthrough will be to gain full independence and actually unite the Serbian people, which live in the five provinces around our current province of northern Serbia. And most of the or three of these are in Ottoman Empire, and two are in Austria. So perhaps the one in uh, northern, uh, well, sorry, uh, the ones in Ottoman Empire, probably the first ones we would like to claim back, given especially we're Orthodox, they're Muslim. Uh, we don't we want to throw off that uh, yoke of the Ottomans and unite the Serbian people. To that end, we will uh, aim to build up our industry to actually produce you know, small arms and artillery. So uh, ultimately build up a local and dependable arms industry to raise soldiers and arm them and fight and take on the Ottomans. Uh, and actually have you know the, the government budget to pay for that war. We are also making improving relations with Austria, Wallachia and Russia in the hopes that perhaps they will help us take on the Ottoman Empire. We've set up a trade route with Austria to help our vineyards, you know, our basic industry now consists of vineyards, wheat farms and livestock farms. We've set up vineyards to export our wine and help our local economy that way. Um, Otherwise, in terms of our laws in the first episode, so we have included the Orthodox Church into our government, which is, still means we're writing a righteous government just because how much clout uh, Orthodox Church has. And we have started to pass uh, charitable hospitals in order to uh, unlock the healthcare institution and again reduce mortality and improve our uh, uh, population growth rate, which will hopefully allow us to collect more poll taxes and have more soldiers or more population available, more manpower available for our soldiers. Research-wise, we have decided to go with pharmaceuticals because that will give us an additional level of health institution once there are locks. So with all of that said, let's go ahead and unpause at a slow speed and see you know, how the game changed up. Right off the bat, we can see here we're losing power rank. We have insufficient prestige to maintain our minor power ranking and will become an insignificant power in 363 days unless our standing recovers. We need 17 prestige to maintain our standing and currently have 16. Not great. You gain more prestige by increasing gross domestic product of your nation, increasing power projection of your army and navy, by increasing their size and giving them more powerful equipment, or by being the leading producer of a good. You also gain a proportion of your subjects' prestige in this way. Now, we're not going to be building a navy because we don't even have ports and oh, a sea access. We're not going to be able to build, uh, being building an army anytime soon because we can't afford it. Uh, we are not going to be the leading producer of any good, given that our economy is tiny. We're not. We don't have any subjects because we are subject of the Ottoman Empire ourselves. So the only way for us to improve our prestige and remain a minor power is to grow our domestic product. So to that end, we need to build the most productive in buildings uh, that we can possibly find, which we will continue to do. Now, over on the bottom right, we had a few things fire off, which is the Orthodox Church uh, has activated Divine Right bonus, giving us plus 10 percent authority. Orthodox Church has also activated Beat Fruitful and Multiply, giving us plus 2% birth rate. Excellent. Goes exactly with our strategic aim of uh, maximizing our population growth, right? We have uh, lathes spreading, uh, as just because other people have unlocked this text, so that's spreading to us. We have paddle steamer spreading, and we have banking spreading. Good banking. Again, we'll have a look. It will help us with our government budget, 
Blaze helps us, uh, so it's a type of tool that will help us with producing clothes and furniture effectively, just a little bit down the line. So all good things happening. One thing I actually did forget uh, to do just before I paused, but it's okay, we're only five, five days in, is if we go to our political lens, again, I will go over this in more detail, but just so we, you know, we just spend you know, a whole of the second episode in pause mode. Let's go ahead to decrease, and decrease are something, for those of you who don't know, they use authority, another one of the resources, right? And see right now we have a thousand authority, wow, right? The reason why we have a thousand, 1.1K authority is because we have base value of 100, then we are a monarchy, we have 200, we have autocracy, we have 200, 150 from national supremacy, right? So we're super united, right? Our government has a lot of authority. We have state religion, we get another 200, and we have rights of assembly, another 50, and then another 10%, and another 10% bonus, one from a ruler trait, experienced political operator, and 10% from uh, Orthodox Church just activating divine rights. So everyone in our nation believes or the orthodox church preaches divine right so we have tons of authority now what does that do it decreases our law enactment time by 25 percent we'll talk about that in a little bit but we're so far in excess in fact we're so far in excess we don't we're not consuming any authority so all of this is just kind of wasted right now right now it doesn't do anything for us at all right what can we do with authority well various things one of which is a decree right there's a number of decrees here, but the useful one that we need now is road maintenance. And that's a, that says expand and maintain road networks. What does that do? That gives us 10% state construction efficiency, uh, which means we will build buildings faster. We'll talk a little bit uh, about exactly how they're going to be built fast. We have plus one infrastructure per 100,000 population. We have 800,000 population. Give us an extra eight infrastructure. We're well below our cap, but still nice. We have plus 20 maximum infrastructure from population. Again, uh, kind of uh, basically just it just means that this actually caps out at 20, uh, etc. This bonus. So we can, but the main bonus for this is 10% state construction efficiency. It's not great, but it doesn't hurt, right? So let's go ahead and enact this decree. We'll talk about other decrees and we'll revisit that in a bit. But for now, uh, that's probably enough. Now, because uh, oh, actually, no, sorry, let's go back to decrees. Another useful decree you could want to enact is issue promote social mobility which will encourage the population to strive for higher job qualifications it will improve qualifications to access meaning it will be easier for pops to upskill but we're not having an industry we don't, not, don't have any need to upskill it will also improve education access by 25 percent which means our literacy will gravitate towards 25 percent is that a good thing or a bad thing let's uh, leave that and we'll discuss that in a bit for now i will actually hold off from putting that on although you could um but we were not going to do that. We could also encourage you know, our agriculture industry, but we don't really need to, given none of the prices are too high, right? And if we put this in, yes, it would produce more goods, but that would just uh, depress their price further, reducing the profitability of the building, potentially even getting some of the workers fired or uh, reducing uh, the wage. So no other decree is really necessary right now. Let's go ahead and close this and go back and unpause now. We'll monitor losing our rank, right? But we need to grow our GDP uh, within the next 360 days. Now, uh, let's look at a little bit of our construction since we actually started constructing something, right? So we are building logging camps. We have 10 construction really comes from just, uh, so you see we have 10 out of 10 construction being used and we have 10 from base value, right? It costs... Uh, as I have mentioned before, we go to the, the state and we'll look at the buildings. For example, logging camps cost 200 construction to build, right? We're producing 10, so it takes us 20 weeks to build it. So we click it, we have 18 weeks left. But broadly, one week passes in top right, right? And we advance. Now we actually... Um, uh, hang on a second. So we did enact... State construction efficiency. It points to construction progress in a state. Okay, interesting. We're not actually getting 10% right now. And I believe the reason for that is that... Hmm, that actually applies perhaps to construction sector. So another way that we could you know, increase this, since we only get 10 from base, which is not a, not a bad amount. Uh, but we could build a construction sector, right? So what does that do? You know, a construction sector costs 100 construction to build, so it only take 10 weeks, 
right? It's got 10% mortality of labor, so it will, you know, again, we talk about population growth rate a lot. And aside from that being affected by standard of living, which is probably the primary uh, determinant, literacy decreases birth rate, therefore narrows the differential between birth rate and mortality. Now, for POPs being employed in certain industries, is an extra mortality kind of modifier. So it's quite dangerous to work in construction. We have no regulations, which uh, much later down the line we could potentially um, uh, institute. But right now we don't. And so laborers who will work in construction sector will face, it says plus 10%, but you know, that really I think means like 1%. Uh, it's kind of this, this number's slightly confusing to me. But basically it will increase mortality slightly. And we will have a look uh, when we actually have people employed. We'll have a look at that pop and just break it down in detail. And we give, it will give us plus two construction, so 20% increase effectively, right? It will consume fabric and wood, which we'll need to pay for. It does have the benefit of kind of actually uh, increasing demand for these goods within our economy. So it's kind of a good thing that those buildings who are using them... Oh, let's go have, have a look at what's going on. Great Britain has responded angrily to the Qing ban on opium with multiple threats towards government of Great Qing. Okay, so a potential imperialist war could erupt there. But let's go ahead and unpause. Keep our... Uh, oops, actually, sorry. Let's actually pause for a second and just finish what we're talking about because things are already starting to change in our nation that we're not even noticing. Um, but, sorry, where was I? Construction. Indeed, buildings. So we could build a construction sector that would... Increase demand for fabric and wood, making those buildings more profitable. We're currently producing fabric in livestock ranches. It's minus 32% below price, right? And we could, we would need wood, however. Uh, here's the construction sector. We'd need 75 wood. We are not producing any now, but we're actually building logging camps, right? These logging camps will produce 30 wood. Um, so... It is not exactly that, you know, we need 75 and they produce 30, therefore we only satisfy half of the demand. The reality that the differential will be made up in price uh, up to, uh, and we have access to the Ottoman market, so we'd actually buy wood from there as well if we needed to. If we were in our one state province, then if the buy orders or if demand for wood is more than double, uh, the supply, for example, if we did, if we were on our own, in our own little market of one state, and we built a construction sector that demanded 75 wood, and we'd only be producing 30, that means we would have, right, double the demand of product, uh, the demand would exceed production by two times, right, and that means we'd actually face a shortage, and that would be a really bad thing, that would re kind of throttle our construction sector. We'll see, we'll see if that happens down the line, and I'll probably give a better explanation. But for now, you know, we do want to build things faster, given we are on a sort of uh, tight timeline to actually, or not that tight timeline, but we want to provide jobs to our unemployed as quickly as possible. So let's go ahead and schedule a, put a construction sector in the queue straight away. So we'll build logging camps, start producing some wood. We'll then build a construction sector that will actually consume some of that wood, consume some of the fabric, pull up our uh, economy, right? Um, and so continue to grow our GDP, employ these people who will stop starving, um, right? Uh, and it only takes 10, uh, sort of 100 construction, so it only is going to take 10 weeks. Let's go ahead and pause, and let's have a look. Austria, Ottoman rivalry declared. Austria have declared Ottoman Empire to be their rival. That's kind of good for us. We could probably get into some sort of defensive alliance as we are improving relations with them. That's it for construction, if enough to understand it, right? Different buildings, or you see manufacturing buildings, for example, cost, uh, right, any of these cost 600 construction, right? Some buildings like universities cost 800. Hmm? Actually, wait, universities now cost 400? I thought they were 800 before. Interesting. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, government, for example, administration costs 400. Wheat farms cost 200, and so on. Ottoman Empire improving relations with us. Okay. Not necessarily a bad thing, given, you know, it's at least 10, 20 years before we can actually do anything. So we kind of want to just play off Austria against Ottomans. Maybe we don't want uh, a defensive pact yet. You know, we just want to let them fight each other out, weaken themselves. Maybe they will have some internal strife and collapse on themselves and we'll be there to seize the opportunity. So for now, 
our diplomacy, you know, will just maintain an agile stance. Uh, so there we are. So let's go ahead and just, uh, sorry, pause again just for a second. That's kind of construction. Uh, and there's more to say, but we'll 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 uh, hold that thought for a second. Actually, let's go ahead and unpause at speed one now. Let's talk about laws, right? An enactment of laws, as I mentioned at the end of episode one. Uh, but right now we have a 16% chance of success. Success meaning the law enactment will pass to the next phase. And it needs to do that three times in order to, for the law to actually be adopted and, 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 and for us to unlock its benefits, right? Uh, you see it's ticking down here. So sorry, let's go ahead and look at the tooltips we have. In 10 days, one of the following will happen. Right? And it says 10 days because base it takes about 100 days for something to happen to the event, right? Some sort of like event, uh, right? And we have minus 25% from righteous government because we have so much legitimacy. So we pass laws quickly, right? The legislative system works uh, fast, so to speak, right? Everyone is aligned. The government is aligned. Everyone's kind of pushing through working double time or like legislation generally passes through faster. We have another minus 25% from legislative efficiency which is from having um surplus a great surplus authority right right now we started consuming 100 to pass the decree of road maintenance in northern serbia that means we need plus 100 uh, uh or above right to get this uh, uh bonus so right now effectively we're plus 980 so we're wasting 880 authority it does absolutely nothing for us Right, 880 authority. We do need 100 because it's a nice bonus to have. But effectively, right, uh, I'm going to pause because there's only seven days left. But what can happen? So every 100 days, which is for us reduced by 25% and another 25%, so by 50% to 50 days. So every 50 days, something will happen. What can happen? The law can succeed. Enactment success indicates the percentage chance that a law will progress to the next phase at the next checkpoint, right? With every 50 days, we have a checkpoint. Let's call them that. It is equal to the base success chance plus any effects accumulated during the enactment process. We haven't had any uh, kind of any events pop up while we're enacting the law. So it's just 16% because Orthodox uh, Church's clout is 16%. 16% because 16% of political power in our nation supports the Orthodox Church. Uh, right. Now, another option at the next checkpoint is advance, right? Enactment advance indicates the percentage chance that the enactment process of a law will advance somehow at the next checkpoint, even if it won't complete or progress to the next phase yet. It is derived from the enactment, enactment's base success chance. So it's, we have 16%. Now, advance factor is times two, right? Uh, and right now we have no stalled enactment, so there's no malice. So it's effectively 32% chance that Yes, it won't, it won't progress to the next phase, right? At least uh, it still will be kind of in the phase of introduction, but something positive will happen. And typically, I think a lot of the time, it's something like success chance will actually increase, right? So like, yes, it didn't pass the next phase, but people are now understand the law better. And so the introduction phase is more likely at the next checkpoint in another 50 days to actually proceed to consideration phase, right? And that will stack and then, that, 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 for example, added maybe success chance will uh, accumulate uh, until for adoption phase and to actually enact the law. Now, debate, we also have 51% of debate. Debate, enact, enactment debate indicates the percentage chance that the enactment process of a law will meet some kind of a complication at the next checkpoint, right? The lower the total chances of success, advance, and stall, the greater the chance of debate. So debate is kind of a, a plug percentage uh, from, the, uh, from success, advance, or stall, because that's what can really happen. You basically succeed, produce, uh, advance the next state, uh, phase, you advance, something positive happens, or you stall, something negative happens. And stalled enactment indicates the percentage chance that the enactment process of a law will be substantially hindered at the next checkpoint. Its base chance is equal to the total clout of opposing interest groups in government, right? In government. So that's important. So let's have a look just quickly at our law. Charity hospital. See, no one actually cares. So in fact, no one in our nation opposes outright opposes charity hospitals and certainly no one in our government no one here opposes right if for example we look at something like industrialists we'll have their ideologies we'll go over what ideologies are well yeah but for example let me just 
find it. There we are. For example, they have individualist ideology. So if industrialists were not marginalized, right? Uh, and they were in our, in fact, if they were in our government, for example, they would, so it says here, neutral, actually not sure. They're still neutral towards charity hospitals. They actually wouldn't care. Um, hmm, interesting. Well, if someone did oppose, I'm not sure who would it be, for example. Oh yeah, I think, for example, trade unions, I'm sure they would oppose. Uh, so let's find it. I'm sure they would oppose rights of women, health system. There. Yeah. No, they're actually neutral towards charity hospitals right now. Okay. No one really opposes. Everyone is in favor. But if they did oppose it and they had, for example, 5% clout, then the stall percentage chance here would be 5%, which would means the debate as the plug would be lower. So let's go ahead and I'll pause and wait and just see what happens. All right. So in theory, we could enact this law in uh, right 50 days and it would succeed so that would be 50 days another 50 days and another. so 150 days would be the absolute minimum half a year we'd need to enact this law right so let's go ahead and just wait for a second and five days watch a week this week ends and let's see boom what happened That's another three days left sorry Diplomatic ties with two Sicilies lost. Right, this is due to two Sicilies losing their interest in the Balkans. We are no longer able to conduct diplomacy with them. Right, so we can't. We have no contact with two Sicilies. Let's just quickly, quickly jump to that. So if we go to diplomacy, everyone can declare interests. Because we are a minor power, we can only declare one interest. So we could actually go ahead and declare an interest in Italy. These regions are pretty large. And whoever is part or has at least one state in that... In that... Um, in that strategic sort of big region where we declared interest, we would be able to trade with them with two Sicilies through the Ottoman uh, kind of market, through their ports, for example, of Tirana in Albania. And we could also, you know, for example, improve relations with them. Whereas if we go there now, diplomatic relations, improve relations, we just can't, right? We can't because like we have we have no strategic interest in them and they have no strategic interest in us. Let's go ahead, <clears throat> remove all of this and let's keep waiting for our law and just observe what happens? Actually, sorry. Yep, there we are. Law advancement. Charity hospitals has attracted new supporters, increase, increasing enactment success by 15%. Right? So, what has happened? That means the advance event has fired off. Right? Remember that was... Oh, I remember that was like 16 and 50... It was 50% debate, it was 16% from our cloud, right? So that means it was something like 34%, what was it? Yeah, it was 34%, right? Because it was 16% times 2. Yeah, exactly. It was 32% chance to advance. This event has fired off, so effectively something positive has happened, right? And what positive was, was that we got 15% uh, from law enactment, uh, law enactment uh, chance. So now we have 16%. From Orthodox Church's cloud, which is declining, unfortunately, right? And we have plus 15% from law enactment uh, advance from this one advance event, right? Now we have another 50 days until the next checkpoint. At that checkpoint, we now have a 30% chance that this law will advance to the next phase, right? Now we have still have the same uh, chance of advance, which is a factor of two. That's just base times the cloud of the interest groups. Uh, in government that are supporting this law. So it's still 30%. And the debate has fallen because it's the plug, right? And stall is zero because there's no interest group in government that opposes this law, right? Let's wait 50 days. So we're now more, much more likely, well, twice as likely to proceed, right? Or perhaps we'll get another chance uh, that will increase uh, enactment success chance again, right? And that will make it easier in the later phases, right? So let's go ahead and unpause. Keep the time rolling. That's effectively what happened, right? We have another 50 days. Now, let's uh, remove this and let's actually consider another thing. Let's go to our politics. So as we saw, the clout of Orthodox Church is full. Well, it's actually interesting. 6.2% here. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, okay, because we unpaused again. Maybe it recalculated. Uh, yes, it is 16.2. Okay, it's actually... So you see, so it does also change dynamically. 
as the clout of the interest group that proposes it changes. Now, why is it 16.2%, right? Let's go have a look at you know, what is the Orthodox Church, right? Uh, the Orthodox Churches tend to be Eastern Churches not in communion with the Pope, okay? So that's kind of who it is. It's got clout of 16.2%. Uh, where does that come from? From wealth, 42. Average wealth of 11 of the Pope supporting, plus 5 for a pop, politically active pop. And we have then on top 30% uh, from state religion. And again, clout among all interest groups adds up to 100%, right? So it's always kind of a zero sum game. Uh, you know, it goes, political power goes somewhere. Except there are pops that are politically unaligned. So their pop, political power is just wasted, same as dependents. Uh, and that's, we're talking about working adults as well, which each has dependents. Dependents, their political power is also much smaller. Uh, oh, have a, let's have a look here. Rural folk are now influential. Rural folk used to be marginalized. Now they're influential. So that means they have progressed up into being kind of in opposition as opposed to just being irrelevant. Uh, this kind of, what does that change, right? That changes the fact that they have, first of all, more than 5% clout. So that means more political power has somehow uh, flowed to rural folk, right? Uh, there's no political power for number trade unions. No one supports trade unions right now. No one supports industrialists. No one supports petite bourgeoisie yet. Right? And it's just flatlined uh, kind of out here. Rural folk is now in opposition. So I'm going to go ahead and pause at a low speed. Uh, that means if they had these sort of bonuses from their approval, they would activate, right? Just like we currently have uh, kind of negative malices from intelligentsia and armed forces. So we'll, I will talk in a bit as to why that happens. But for now, what I was going to say is that, for example, we like the Orthodox Church, right, with their pious ideology. Uh, so, and we want that law to pass quicker. So what we could do is we could go here and we could bolster. So plus 30% bolstered impact on interest group attraction. Go ahead and bolster the Orthodox Church. What that will do is that various pops, right, like for example, clergy are obviously... You know, they're very likely. So if we take the clergy, they're very likely to support the Orthodox Church because they are priests, scholars, and other religious le leaders tending to the spiritual needs of the rural population. Politically, they're the backbone of the devout. However, and they're pretty wealthy, so they do carry 70,000 of political power, right? Uh, which is, if we look at very quickly, population, for example, charts. Clergy are the second most powerful uh, political group after aristocrats, right? They, they they hold 15% of uh, political clout. However, we'll look at this and we'll look at these clergymen. So the biggest, uh, so 2.8 thousand. Even among clergy, right, only 63% uh, support Orthodox Church. So, right, because people do have different opinions. Quite a few of them are actually on the side of rural folk as opposed to the church in terms of politics, right? And they support their ideology. They have their like world views. In a sense, right? Because if we um, look at the tool for interest group, it kind of has a good explanation of what it is, right? A political faction within your country that uh, that share a common interest. Oh, uh, sorry, let's have a look at down bottom. Uh, a little event which is relevant to us. Great Britain have declared Ottoman Empire to be their rival. Okay, another potential ally in our struggle for independence and unification. Um, but sorry, uh, let's go ahead. Here. So let's go back to politics, Orthodox Church, and so clergymen. Uh, what? Where were we? Yeah. So only 63% of them supported, right? Uh, so we're reading the interest group tooltip, right? A political faction within your country that share a common interest. They are su supported by pops in relation to their attraction to them, and the cloud they enjoy is based directly on the supporting this pop's political strength. Interest groups have a number of ideologies, causing them to endorse or oppose different laws, right, and enable us to pass them uh, if they do endorse them, and they're in government. They also have three interest group traits that are activated on different approval levels. Their leaders' personal ideology also rubs off on the interest group, and in fact overrides the ideology if there is a conflict. Oh, have a think. Let's pause. So we've had another 50-day pass, right, another checkpoint. It wasn't a success, so the law did not progress from introduction to consideration 
but it was, I guess, an advance. Sorry, debate. It was a debate event. So it wasn't just something positive. It was a debate, so it needs some kind of complication. Right? And this complication is presented as an event. So let's have a look. With the calls for some of the for some form of healthcare system, many are questioning where the money for setting up the new healthcare system will come from. Some are suggesting simply taking it out of our tax funds, while others insist the government should find another way to cover the costs. Let me get this straight. You expect us to not only pay for our own healthcare, but someone else's as well? I don't want the money I pay in taxes to be used to, so some random farmers are able to get healthcare. This is not my responsibility. I have my own health and family to think of. I can't possibly afford to look after everyone else in Serbia as well. Alright, so effectively an event with some flavor and we can pick a choice, right? For example, take it from the tax fund. So that kind of depends how do we want to role play, I guess, our country, so to speak. We can take it from the tax funds and that gets Serbia gets healthcare tax, which actually doesn't do much, I guess, right now. While charity hospitals is enacted, industrialists lose two approval. And Serbia gets taxing health. Uh, plus, so we get plus 20% enactment success chance. We could say, we could pick the option of the government should cover the costs. And that means Serbia gets government subsidies while charity hospitals is being enacted. A little odd that it doesn't actually say the amount. I think perhaps because we don't uh, have like any, we don't pay for the government. So maybe that's what's confusing the game. Or maybe that isn't intended that way. But typically this would say something like for the next, while the law is being enacted, we just get an arbitrary kind of additional expense of whatever it is, like plus minus minus 100 or 200. But now it's actually zero. But if we were to do this, we would uh, get plus 30% enactment success chance. Or we can just say we can get by without it. Uh, we get And we get plus 10% enactment chance. Obviously, let's get plus 30% enactment chance. Right? This should cost us something, but I guess it's not costing us anything. Maybe it's because we're not employing any bureaucrats. So it's just zero. So let's go ahead. The government should cover the costs. Boom. Right? So 50 days have passed. We hit a checkpoint. A debate event has fired off, which has some like 30% chance. Right? And we added 30% to our success chance. Again, another 50 day rolls. So while people are working in the legislature on the law. So we're now into, right, we're 100 days over. Uh, you know. And another 50 days will pass, and we're now our success chances matter. It's 61% that we progress to the next phase. Or 32% that something positive again will happen. And only 5.9% that an event will fire off. So let's go ahead and unpause, just to keep the time rolling. You know, and that is that is how laws get passed. Let's go ahead and minimize this. And you know, even if we had to pay something, for example, there, right, we have a surplus. We're building up, in fact, a uh, kind of a uh, a gold reserves here so we could pay for the 30 percent chance of enactment only any you know, of that expense would only typically would only last until the law while the law is being enacted so plus 30 percent would actually make this whole thing go faster uh improve standard of living uh by 0 0.5 for our lowest strata and reduce mortality and basically in various ways benefit our population growth that which already you can see so the economy has adjusted we build we haven't built the logging camps yet but I guess uh, the economy has adjusted a little bit. Maybe those, you know, the other, because we lowered the taxes. In fact, I, I, that's what I'm guessing. We lowered the taxes and we put extra money in people's pockets, improved their standard of living, right? And indeed we have. We're now at 6.4 as opposed to 5.6, which means everyone started having more babies. The birth rate has improved and it now outweighs even the negative effect of those 100,000 laborers that are starving, right? So overall, we actually turned positive just from reducing our taxation level. We actually reduced income taxes, but I think the biggest effect was from poll taxes, right? So that's why uh, we're in positive territory right now. Okay, have a look. So this, okay, the logging camps are about to be constructed. So sorry, we're going to veer away from politics. And in fact, uh, okay, let's go ahead and unpause. So let's just keep the game on pause, but let's let the logging camps be constructed but I just wanted to talk about something else as well uh, and you'll see so unemployed we are 22,000 so a few people were kind of employed I think there was kind of a, kind of a few people missing from full employment in other buildings so if people got employed we still have 152,000 peasants or work in subsistence farms size of 32 
Uh, and so here we are. Logging camps have been built. So let's, let's keep the game progressing and see what happens. Now we have started to construct a uh, construction sector straight away. Uh, so that's good. So our construction queue is doing something. But let's see. Right. So we have logging camps. Right now is your productivity. They're just in the process of hiring people to actually produce wood, you know, chop, chop wood. So let's see. So every week, the logging uh, building attempts to hire people. We'll see logging camps is okay, unable to fully hire. Uh, to be honest, yeah, that's kind of a, just uh, irrelevant. It's just the game being a little bit iffy. Um, let's go ahead and wait for the week up here to pass and we'll see what happens. Right, so we're playing at very slow speed, almost excruciatingly slow, even for me. But I just want to, for the first time, I want to show you guys what happens. So there you go. So, right, so we hired 500 people. So we hire them kind of every week in batches. And the building kind of sees, okay, we hire a few people. We start producing how the price changes. Is it worth for me to keep hiring people, uh, right? And kind of ramping up production as well. That obviously takes time as well, right? No building just switches on within a week. So it will take... Right, so it probably takes 500, it's probably take about 10 weeks to actually fully hire. But we can see, so employment, right? We currently employ 500 people. Oh my god, come on, give us the tooltip, give me the tooltip. Okay, sorry. There we are. We deploy 450 laborers and 50 shopkeepers. So all buildings employ several classes of people. Here it's laborers and shopkeepers. They always employ them uh, proportionally. So, you know, it, it cannot be, you know, the game doesn't work that way, that we would hire, you know, full stack of laborers, which would be something like 4,000, and then no shopkeepers because others, we didn't have qualifications or we didn't have enough uh, pops to, you know, to make into shopkeepers. Like that doesn't happen. It's always proportional. So if you can't hire the 50 shopkeepers to manage the thing, you can't hire the 450 laborers. I don't think the proportion is exactly this, but you basically can't fully employ laborers without having, uh, you know, a decent number of shopkeepers. So extremes are not allowed, but somewhere in between is kind of allowed. You'll see latest employee changes. They hired 425 laborers that were previously unemployed and eight shopkeepers from previously unemployed, I guess, labor keepers. So some people upskilled. We'll talk about what qualifications are and where they come from in a bit. But basically, right, some we had, I don't think we had any shopkeepers unemployed. Maybe we had, uh, but I don't think so. So it was maybe laborers just got upskilled. We also hired shopkeepers that used to be laborers in wheat farms, right? So some people upskilled from being a laborer. So they did got enough wealth, got enough education to be able to be, well, actually, shopkeeper maybe doesn't quite require education, but they had enough qualifications because generally pops do want to take on a better job, right? And so some laborers from wheat farms actually came and say, hey, I want to be a shopkeeper. And some shopkeepers used to be clergymen in subsistence farms, but they found a better life here in our logging camps and they switched their pop kind of type, switched their profession and therefore switched kind of pop type and became shopkeepers. Now, another week has passed. More people were hired. In fact, a couple of weeks have passed while I was talking, right? And again, we're hiring laborers from unemployed now only, so not from other buildings. Uh, some farmers, some people used to be farmers in livestock ranches. Uh, and again, this is, be uh, you know, why do people kind of migrate and upskill and do this? It's because this building is quite profitable, right? Price 69, so it's good. It pays wages to laborers and shopkeepers. It uses one infrastructure and it produces right now 12 wood, it will produce up to 30. You can see here from the base production method. Uh, and it will continue to do that every week. Just hire some people. And you can see again. Uh, so shopkeepers. Yeah, we can, we, for example, we didn't. Interestingly, it wasn't that. Sorry, this tool tip. It wasn't the unemployed laborers that upskilled straight into shopkeepers. It was actually clergymen that became shopkeepers. But that means they vacated, right? Some clergymen spaces in subsistence farms, right? Because subsistence farms didn't all of a sudden, oh, in fact, it is not missing clergymen, right? Because minus 50, clergymen became shopkeepers in logging camps, right? So let's actually see what happens with this. Okay, and we have an event again. Another event fires off because we hit uh, not the 60%, but the 30% chance of advance. So popular playwright endorses reform. Let's go ahead and pause for a second and read this event. In the midst of the debate surrounding charity hospitals, one of the countries is... One of the country's leading playwrights, strongly associated with the Orthodox Church, has staged a widely acclaimed play whose politically laden themes makes no secret of the author's desire for the law to be passed. The man's viewpoint may be somewhat a partisan, 
but sir, you cannot argue with his prose, right? So again, this is an advance event, so something positive has happened, right? Which will allow us to kind of advance the law, but it's not as simple as advance, which just gives us, right, a... Uh, actually, no, sorry, this is an advance event, so for example, so... Those can sometimes be simple things, like where just they just add things, right, to the success chance, but I guess sometimes there are these more colorful, more involved events with a few options for us to pick from. Let's go to what options do we have then to deal with this playwright? So we can say charity hospitals will be on everyone's lips now, and we get 10% enactment success chance, so it's up to 72% here. We can also pick, this sure puts the Orthodox Church in a good light, and that gives plus 10% interest group pop attraction for five years to Orthodox Church, right? And that is what I talked about before, is that if we wanted the Orthodox Church to have more clout, the reason we'd have it want to have more clout is so that if we pass laws that it endorses, they will have a higher chance of success from, from the get-go. Right? And the reason, kind of, the pop attraction, as again, as we said, so for some clergymen, uh, even clergymen who are very likely to support of the church because it's their sort of like primary politically they're the backbone of the devout even there only about two-thirds of them support orthodox church now we see we started bolstering it so now even the same pop that we looked at just a second ago it was 62 percent now it's 63 so more popular flock right now also for example it's not just clergymen but for example i mean even officers right if, yeah even officers you would think like Right, officers are commissioned officers commanding the nation's military forces in the army and navy. Politically, they represent the upper echelons of the armed forces. And 70% of them support the armed forces because coded into the game, they have very strong preference for armed forces. You know, very, very strong. Right? It's kind of obvious, right? Military men are kind of in their own little group. But still, 16% of them actually support the Orthodox Church, right? So they're kind of devout officers. That, you know, in terms of their way of life or their view of the way society or Serbia should develop, they're more into Orthodox Church. If we picked option number two here, it would modify those base pop uh, attractions that are coded into the game as kind of base level. And we already have a few other modifiers, but this would increase Orthodox Church attraction by 10%. And so there will be more officers, more servicemen, right, because some servicemen... Also, of course, they support armed forces, but their second favorite group is Orthodox. This would tick up at the expense of other interest groups, right? We're already bolstering uh, Orthodox Church, so we're already kind of helping it out with the uh, attraction. So we don't really need this. And our last option here is let us ensure the play gets a wider international audience, right? And I mean, survey gets renowned playwright permanently, and we get plus 20 prestige. Now, let's remember that we're currently facing... Uh, shortage of prestige, right? and in 240 days, we'll be downgraded to a insignificant power. An insignificant power means that we get uh, only 500 influence as opposed to 600. 50 maneuvers per diplomatic play, we'll talk about that when we get to that. It's not relevant for us, right? but we get plus 25% loan interest rate as opposed to 20% that we pay now. We get plus one potential agitators, uh, so it means that more people kind of just kind of agitating for various reforms that we might not even want. And we get minus 25% uh, migration attraction. If there was any migration, uh, you know, they wouldn't even get any. Or people would want to leave our nation because they think it's so... Uh, they're not proud of it as much anymore, right? And we need 18 prestige to maintain our standing, and we currently have 16. So this, to be honest, is a great option. Yes, 10% enactment success chance would be nice, but getting plus 20 prestige, and we'll go ahead and let us ensure the play gets a wider international audience. So international audience get this uh, play, right? And everyone thinks Serbia is a great nation. We'll go ahead and click that. Doesn't check, test, change anything about our law, sadly. But it will give us more prestige, 35, right? And remove the issue of us losing rank. That's it. That issue has gone away. Right? And sort of an unintended almost benefit of passing charity hospitals. That's great. Now, where were we? God, there's so much to go through, guys. That's why we're going at like a super low speed, but we're enacting the law. What were we talking about before? We were looking at logging camps, weren't we? And why? What is happening here? So every week they're employing a little, you know, a few people. And you can see those people come from unemployed, especially the laborers. Uh, oops, sorry. The laborers are very likely to keep coming from unemployed, right? Same as, and, there, and there's some shopkeepers, so some unemployed 
have uh, qualified to be shopkeepers. Many of the shopkeepers here are actually coming from clergymen. Now, you will recall, right, that uh, clergymen, as we just talked about, mostly support the Orthodox Church. Whereas shopkeepers are a different type of pop, they have a different view of life because of their job. Therefore, they are likely to support other interest groups, right? So we're likely, uh, because we're building new buildings, giving pop new jobs, we are, we are rebalancing the interest group support and clout, right? And therefore, our society starts to adopt a kind of different views on life, therefore endorsing and being against different types of laws. Now, before we have a look at the shopkeepers, let's actually have a look at one other thing here, and that we've these trade centers have appeared, right? Which we didn't have at the start of the game, if you remember. We didn't have any urban buildings. Let's go have and have a look at them. They're super productive, actually. That's great. Paying us uh, you know a good wage. They're employing 1.7 thousand people, and all of those are shopkeepers. Serban Orthodox shopkeepers, right? Now, they are that's cash reserves, it's level seven. Right, what are these? These are base production, kind of, it's a trade center run by merchant guilds, which is why it's employing shopkeepers and not any other type of pop. And what is it? Trade centers appear, they don't need, they don't need to be constructed, they simply appear automatically in under our urban buildings when we start a trade route that's profitable and that grows. And you remember, to help our vineyards, we started a trade route to Austria, their trade route has grown, it's grown and we're sort of 67 and a half to level 7. It is really productive. This effectively means that we have created sort of 67 and a half buy orders in our market and 67 and a half sell orders in uh, Austrian market, helping our vineyards and so and increasing the price in our market because there's effectively a demand, external demand, right? No one drinks wine in Serbia or even in the Ottoman market, but they do. We now have that little access just to that good uh, from the Austrian market, right? And it's grown, so it's uh, we're getting some tariffs from that, which is great, to be honest. So we actually trade only after tariffs, 645 we're getting. So it's a huge trade route, level 7, right? It's all land-based, perfect for us. And we pay some wages to the shopkeepers, we get some money from tariffs. It doesn't use any infrastructure, but we do get urbanization from it. Uh, right, trade revenue, we get 115k. Uh, right, sort of 25% migration attraction. So all great. We're basically exporting our wine. Let's have a look quickly. Uh, hold on, let's actually pause the game because we're about to complete our construction sector. And I just want to put another building in the queue for our construction sector. Now, what should we build next? Right? That's a question arises. Now, what is our objective? Our objective is to employ the unemployed as quickly as possible. We need to give people jobs, right? We have to build another building, plus we're going to have the construction sector. On the construction sector, we'll need to pay wages and we will need to buy goods. The construction sector, I'll tell you right now, wants fabric and wood, right? It wants 75 wood, quite a lot of wood. Whereas in our logging camps, we're only producing, well, up to 30 right now, right? Now, again, I won't go into like a long-winded explanation, but I'll just tell you that the effective choices we have, we could build a tools workshop. Because that will produce tools, which are in demand. You can see there are plus, six, plus 0.61 predicted earnings per week, right? So it will be a really profitable building. It will employ people. They will increase their standard of living, uh, right? Uh, everything's going to be great. But that will cost 600 construction, right? So that will take quite a long time to build, right? Whereas we need to get people employed, preferably faster, right? It will consume 30 wood and produce tools. And no, again, no one really uses tools in our market just yet. Logging camps could use tools. We do have access to the sawmill technology or sort of production method. We'll have a think in a second as to do we want to or not. And in fact, we could right now simply switch to sawmills, produce 60 wood and feed our construction sector that way. But instead, what I am going to do is just build another logging camps. And I'll explain why as soon as the construction sector um uh, appears and we start to get this loop so next thing we're going to build is another logging camp now um let's go ahead uh, and any really the I'll, I'll explain in a second but the main reason why i built that as opposed to tooling workshops is because 
logging camps also will be built in just 20 weeks, right? In just 20 weeks, we will build uh, a whole building and employ another 5,000 people, get them out of unemployment and out of starvation. So let's go ahead and unpause to keep you running. So we'll see the construction sector is about to be completed, right? Now, logging camps continue to employ people. Price of wood is currently minus 21%, right? Another 16 weeks and we'll build the, the next logging camps. Why is it 16 weeks now? It's, remember, we have road maintenance. That gives us a little bit of a bonus. Um, and we have the construction sector now. Uh, well, actually, I, yeah, wait, hang on a sec. For example, so 16 weeks. A week may have passed, so it's 17. So weekly construction allocation is 12. And we can actually see here why. So it's 10.2 construction provided by Serbia. Why 10.2? Efficiency of weekly construction in northern Serbia is modified by construction sector in northern Serbia. We get plus 10% from road maintenance, so it's effectively 11. Plus 10% from efficient bureaucracy, which is us having, again, the surplus of bureaucracy here. We have 36, we have 63, everything above positive 63 just gets wasted. So we have kind of 30 uh, surplus that just gets wasted. But the first 36 actually gives us a bonus of up to 10% construction. So we're actually having 12 construction. When we come to build buildings, uh, we have 12 plus this 0.24, which is uh, 0 0.2 0 from wooden buildings. And 0 0.2 we have from construction sector starting to ramp up. Let's go ahead and unpause, keep the time ticking, and we will see. Also, just note the fact that our, our budget surplus, despite us having super low taxes, you know, the only thing we're spending it on was we're spending about 533. Actually, we are spending a little bit on government wages now in the construction sector. We are, and, and now we're spending on military goods and military wages, right? Temp oh, here we are. Oh, sorry, temporary national expenses on goods. Yeah, so there you go. So we have a... Right now we have a big surplus, so I would say we have, and we have built up, almost maxed out our gold reserves. We'll talk about how does that maximum is derived as well. Uh, um, but we are, you know, we're going to start spending money on this new building. This is when we go back. You can see there is a little, uh, you know, sort of a column type uh, temple sort of sign, which means that this is a construction sector. It's the government building. The wages and eventual material expenses will be paid from your treasury. The wages will be moving towards the average wages in the state. Okay, so the construction sector has been constructed. It is now employing people. Who is it employing? It's employing bureaucrats, a new pop type that we haven't had before, clerks, which we haven't had before. And you can see laborers have upskilled from wheat farms. Bureaucrats have uh, used to be aristocrats in subsistence farms, but they chose to be bureaucrats now. And laborers, um, there used to be laborers in wheat farms, so they came to work in the construction sector. Uh, you see, another week passes, we, and we employ more people. As we employ more people, we uh, raise demand for wood, so we buy wood, and we raise demand for fabric. And buy that fabric, we pay wages for the people who are already employed. It does use two infrastructure, but it gives us 0 0.6 construction, right? So already we got, uh, right, on top of 10, we're now actually beyond 10.6. Right, so sort of 6% increase effectively. This state construction efficiency will, again, raise once it's fully employed. It's just a small number that we can't quite see yet. People who work here suffer a 10% mortality, right? And it gives us five urbanization. So let's go ahead and wait for it to be fully employed and speed up our construction in general. However, note the fact that we now have something, you know, some something putting strain on our budget. Now have a look, law progress to consideration. Again, so 50 days have passed. A checkpoint has triggered. It was a success finally. So the first two times, sorry, the first time it was what, advance. Then we had, and it was plus, right, yeah, it was plus 15%. Then we had a debate event. And then we had an advance event, which altogether for, for the, Advance event, we got 20 prestige. For the debate event, we got plus 30% uh, uh, from taxing health, right? So it is now 60%. And then now we actually finally hit the success charts. We, now it's possible that in 45 days, we'll again hit success and simply move to adoption. And there's a 35% chance, again, based on 17.6 uh, of the clout that is supporting this uh, law, which is our uh, Orthodox Church. 
and we're bolstering their uh, support level. We're bolstering them, so more people are flocking towards supporting that interest group. That's multiplied by two, just the base factor. And so 35% of an advance, some sort of, I guess, positive type event. Our 62% success chance, right? Should just simply go ahead and uh, advance the law to the adoption phase. But right now, it's in the consideration phase. Let's keep watching our construction sector, right? That's it. So we ramped up to plus one construction. So now everything gets constructed fa faster. That is a good thing. We're employing people as opposed to leaving the unemployed. That is a good thing for the economy, right? We're growing our GDP because, uh, you know, these people are getting paid. And we are raising demand for wood and fabric, which is making, for example, right now, go to logging camps. Remember, this price used to be something like 18% below. Now it's actually plus 7%. So this building is becoming more and more profitable, right? So the shopkeepers who own this are getting more profits. Uh, so although right now the profits, as the building is now fully employed, it is profitable. These profits actually first go to cash reserves, which means the building or this business builds up a buffer of 25,000, right? That in the event of building becoming unprofitable, instead of firing people straight away and reducing production, right? If it's just a temporary fluctuation of a few, you know, weeks or months, then it will reduce the cash reserves first, right? And then it will build them back up. Once the cash reserves are full, it will start paying dividends to the ownership pops. And we see their ownership method right now is merchant guilds. So it's the 500 shopkeepers that kind of are proprietors of kind of various logging camps, industry, in our state of northern Serbia. Um, also, the sum of all cash reserves is actually what I talked about before. It is uh, the sum of all cash reserves is what determines our maximum gold reserve limit. So right now it's 66,000 and it will continue to increase as this increases, which allows us to run a surplus for longer and just save up some money. Not necessarily a good thing, but not necessarily a bad thing either. We'll talk about that again more in more, more detail a little bit later. But for now, logging camps are getting more profitable. We're building more logging camps. Construction sector is ramping up. The only negative thing uh, from having a construction sector is it puts strain on our budget, right? We're now paying 1.7 thousand. And for now, you could say, right, that cost is worth it. We're going to build building fast, build, build buildings faster, industrialize faster, get our people employed faster, and that will increase our GDP, um, right? That means our income taxes will go up. That means the standard of living of POPs will go up. who are employed here and get now get paid wages as opposed to being unemployed. Plus, POPs working in the buildings that can <clears throat> that supply goods will have uh, you know high wages or more profits, and their standard of living will increase. That means population growth rate will increase. That means our we have more people. We'll have more poll taxes. And again, we're going to tax their income and dividends as well. So again, stronger budget surplus. And that is what we're working towards in order to be able to build up a military, take on the Ottoman Empire, gain our independence and independence for all Serbian people. Um, but in the short side, we are incurring expenses and we will constantly incur expenses because we have to pay for wages and for goods. Now, Temporarily, we're actually even uh, going into a uh, deficit, although we're not accumulating any debt because we are using our gold reserves first. Now, we do have scope to raise taxes as we're at the lowest level, but we do want to keep it as low as possible to keep kind of uh, the standard of living for our pops, you could say artificially low and help them with their standard of living for now and keep the population growth rate as high as possible, right? Raising this tax rate, uh, again, well, actually, we'll, we should talk also about radicals and loyalists. We'll do that in a bit. But raising this, yes, it would give us more revenue. It will also annoy uh, people quite a bit, and they will become radical because it will decrease their standard of living and it will decrease population growth rate. So we should, or we will aim to, actually keep our taxes for as low as possible. Which is why, for example, we were making a choice of do we build another log camps, logging camps, or do we build another construction sector? We didn't go for another construction sector. And in fact, we will not be able to afford another construction sector for a while 
because this is just too expensive for us, right? Now, there is a way to reduce this cost uh, in one way, and that is to reduce the cost of the goods. Because you see right now, okay, fabric is kind of base price, uh, which is sort of good. We could reduce it in order to reduce the, the government, effectively, or the budget we have allocated to construction sector, effectively, the tax money we spend on uh, construction goods if we reduce the price of fabric. But that would make uh, livestock ranches less profitable. Again, putting less money, potentially even getting some people fired. Uh, right? And that is, again, has that loop that I just went through that I won't go over again in reverse, where pops would lose standard of living. Uh, right? they, would, they would get angry. They would uh, uh, reduce their birth rate and so on and so forth, which is not what we want. Right? Although it would give us more money in our budget because fabric would be cheaper. Now, <coughs> let's just note the fact that while in consideration phase, we hit the 60% chance likely straight away in the first checkpoint, and we simply progress to adoption of the law in any event. Now we're in the third and final phase of adoption. In 50 days, again, it will be a dice roll between success and advance. If we get success, we'll actually enact this law and have the institution of charity hospitals. And the enactment of this law will be complete. But let's wait 50 days for that to happen. Now, Uh, sorry, so let's finish talking about construction. So we could also, for example, wood is quite expensive. So we could, and hopefully once the second logging camps come online, uh, the price of wood will reduce, right? and it will be about base price, and that will kind of strike a balance between having a second building of logging camps that will employ people and be and be profitable, and therefore you know continue to employ people and put some money in people's pockets. Again. Increasing standard of living, keeping people happy, uh, you know, increasing birth rate and, you know, improving our tax base. Uh, and also have the added benefit of us not having to pay so much for this wood here, right? Uh, so you want to keep buildings profitable and their, their output goods, I would say kind of about base price or a little bit above, maybe something like between 0 and 25%. It's a positive for everyone. I'm going to go ahead and pause actually for a second. That's kind of at least the beginning. Uh, I would take that as base case. Um, so yeah, so second logging camps will be welcome. Now we actually come up on the hour again. And we're only in September 1836, but I promise we will go to speed too soon. Once you know, I've explained all the basics, uh, hopefully clearly. Well, there's um, a lot more to say on each one of these subjects. Uh, but let's make uh, a cut here and end the episode. I hope you guys are enjoying it. It is a Let's Learn series, so I'm going super slow and explaining at least the high level, you know, all the mechanics, what is actually happening. And you can see, even in nine months we're here, two buildings were built, a lot has happened, and we haven't even covered as to how the cloud has changed because the pops have changed. We'll probably go over that uh, in the next episode. But for now, uh, thank you a lot for watching, and I really hope to see you in the uh, next episode. Bye.